Good morning, everyone. I'm fine, thank you. Thank you for asking. Um, I'm Dr. Donna Marasco, and I'm the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences here at Drexel. And I want to welcome you all this morning to our Kazmarczyk Lecture. And I particularly want to work, welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Nargis Mavala. That was close. I this is a very special day in the annual life of the College of Arts and Sciences. This lecture is named after Dr. Paul Kazmarczyk, who started teaching at Drexel in 1953 until he retired in 1989. The, we endowed this lectureship in his honor in 1995 for a very special reason. Dr. Kazmarczyk always believed that it was not only sufficient for faculty members to tell students about what was happening, for them to understand just the facts, but that every student who takes a physics class should understand how this relates to the world and should be exposed to the most exciting components of what's happening in physics today. And although the topics may be something that seem very difficult to understand to a freshman taking physics right now, he wanted students to understand that when a faculty member or when our guest speaker today explains it to you, you can really appreciate how not only beautiful physics is, but how important it is for everything that happens in our world from evolution to staying on the world that's standing to figuring out how proteins work together because that includes physics as well. This lecture series has had a number of remarkable people, from Nobel laureates to someone talking about the mission to Pluto, to a question that has been out there for 100 years. We start off with you seeing the laboratories, so getting you in the mindset to say, physics is really something that's cool and that's useful. And now we're bringing you into this lecture for you to think about how you may be involved in doing things along the lines that are being talked about today in your future. And if you're not going to be involved, at least then to continue to understand what you're learning in the classroom so that you can excite your children, your nieces and nephews, the people around you. So I welcome you today and please enjoy the seminar. I would now like to introduce Dr. Michelle Delinsky, a faculty member in the physics department who herself works on small things in terms of particle physics and neutrinos. And she will introduce our lecturer today. Uh, today I'm so pleased to welcome Dr. Nargis Mavlavala. Um, from the MIT Department of Physics, where she is the Curtis and Kathleen Marble Professor of Astrophysics and the Associate Department Head. She actually began working on LIGO, the Laser Interferometric Gravitational Wave Observatory, as a graduate student at MIT, and continued her work as a postdoctoral associate at Caltech. She returned to MIT in 2002 as a faculty member. Um, she's also the recipient of the 2010 MacArthur Fellowship, also known as the Genius Grant. And we're so excited to hear about the results of her career of work on LIGO today. Um, Dr. Mavavala. I don't need that, but thank you, Michelle. <laughs> so hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Excellent, good. So I'm Nergis, and I have to say you've had, had the most exciting morning because all the toys you got to play with at the open house, boy, I wish I had a playground like that all the time. So did you like it? Yes. Excellent, good. So one of the things I want to thank, uh, you know, um, so many of my colleagues and friends here at Drexel for having me here, and to the Kismarchik family, one of the things we have in common is no one really gets to say our last name right. 
So, <laughs> but, uh, but I'm used to it, and uh, so, uh, good. So let me tell you what I'm gonna do here today. I'm gonna take you on a journey. Now, my title tells you that this is gonna be a 100-year journey, but really this is a journey that spans many hundred years, and it's also a journey that it puts us here at the center of the Earth, uh, not the center, I hope we're not in the center, but you know, on the surface of the Earth, and then we're gonna spread ourselves out to the edge of the universe and back. So, brace yourselves. Now, one of the things I wanna tell you that's really important on my title slide is we're gonna to go to the warped side of the universe. This is not any place in the universe you want to be because things over there are rather violent. The other important thing I want to put out there right now is that even though I'm standing here in front of you talking, the work I'm going to show you is the work of over a thousand scientists over four decades. So this is, I'm really just the messenger. If you, if you like what you see, thank them. If you don't like what you hear, it's my fault. All right, so let's get started. About this time last year, on February 12th, 2016, every newspaper across the world in any language you would, you would uh, look it up in, had a science discovery story on the head, in the headlines. And what I want to do today is to unpack for you what that was about, why I'm excited, why you should be excited, and what it really means, so getting past those headlines. Now, one of the things that was really uh, striking to me as a scientist is that First of all, newspapers pick up a scientific story, that's cool, our colleagues, other scientists liked it, but it also really entered mainstream culture. So this is a sign that was photographed in the New York City subway in March 2016. And it basically says it's easier to detect gravitational waves than to find a decent apartment in New York. Um, now I happen to not agree with that, but here we go. Now, before we can talk about gravitational waves and what they are, we really have to take a step back and ask ourselves what we know about the universe and how have we learned that. And there's one word answer, light. Light traveling to us from every corner of the universe has taught us what we know about it. And we know quite a bit, even though I'm sure we're only at the tip of the iceberg. So one nice example of light is it has shown us something about the universe that's a spectacular and violent world out there. So this is an image of a supernova. This particular supernova is called Cassiopeia A. Now what is it? It's essentially a star. It's a star that was actually pretty much like our own sun, but about 300 years ago, this star ran out of nuclear fuel. Now nuclear fuel is the, the, the things that stars burn to shine. So this star stopped shining, and it collapsed under its own gravity, and there was an e explosion. And what we see here today is the remnant of that explosion that happened about 325 years ago. Now, one of the things that I love about this picture of all the beautiful pictures that you can find in astronomy is that it's actually made up of many different colors of light. In fact, colors of light that our eyes cannot even see. So here what we see is the, the red colors out here are taken with an infrared telescope, on, an, an, a NASA telescope out in space called the Spitzer Telescope. The greens and, and yellows are actually visible light, the, the light that we can see, and that uh, image is taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And then finally, the blues and purples out here are actually taken using X-rays. So this is an, the, the uh, Chandra X-ray Observatory took that picture. And putting this all together, we can understand what happened to this object. All this, this material that's glowing, uh, these are ejecta that were pushed out from the star. And in fact, though, you can see that the most energetic parts, the blue and purple X-rays, are the ones that were pushed out the most. Now, there's one other thing in this image that I want you to notice. And unless I point it out to you, most of you might not even notice, but it's really the, the, the jewel in the picture. And it's this little blue dot in the center. I didn't just plop it in there. It's really out there in the sky. And it's only visible using x-rays. It's blue in this image. What this is is a little object called a neutron star. Now, neutron stars are stars that are, are made up of neutrons, so a little bit strange already. And they're stars that are very, very peculiar. What they are, are they're, they have the mass of about our sun. But their radius is 10 
kilometers. So they're a teeny tiny star with all this mass crunched into a very small radius. And in fact, to give you a scale, our own um, sun has a radius of 700,000 kilometers. So this is a very compact, dense star with a lot of gravity around it. Now, one other thing I can tell you about this image is imagine that the parent star, the one that, 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 that exploded, had been much more massive than our sun, maybe three to 10 times more massive than our sun. Then this object in the center would have continued to collapse due to its own gravity and it would have become a black hole. So black holes and neutron stars are cousins, okay? And this is a, a picture of, of how, one, how they're, one way in which they're formed from the depths of ordinary stars. Now here is a picture that actually isn't really a, a, a picture taken with a telescope. This is an artist's rendition of what we think a black hole would look like. This is actually an image that's recreated from observations using X-rays. And what it is, is there's a black hole in the center, and this black hole is sitting in this swirling whirlpool of gas and dust. And because of the extreme gravitational conditions here, this gas and dust is falling into the black hole, and it's being heated up, and it glows in the X-rays. Now, there's one other thing that's, uh, that's very uh, neat about this picture, is that many black holes like these are, are expected to have uh, and we observe them to have these jets. So these are plumes that are sticking out from the poles. And one way to understand that is that black holes are sometimes called sloppy eaters. So they're eating all this gas and dust around their bellies, but then they're burping it up over their poles, okay? So now really the question is, how could we really observe such a thing? You know, this is a, a picture that we have to reconstruct you know, in, with our imaginations uh, from uh, observations of x-rays and really, Black holes, most of the black holes we expect are not sitting in gas and dust like this and could, would not just start glowing. They're black. And so we have to look to another means altogether than light. And that messenger for us is gravity's messenger. And that's what today's talk is going to be about. So to understand gravity, we start with Newton. And most of you, I'm sure, have seen Newton's law. So Newton had a very successful law of gravitation, which actually explained why planets go around the, 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 the stars, why moons go around planets. And it was very simple. It said, if you have two objects of mass one and mass two, they actually e experience a mutual force of attraction that's proportional to their masses and inversely proportional to the square of their distance. Now, Newton himself worried about something that he never got solved in his life. And it turns out even Aristotle worried about that. And Newton worried about how does mass one know about mass two? How does this object know that it should feel attraction to this other object? How do they communicate? And that was not solved for 300 more years until the next hero of gravity shows up, and that was Einstein. And Einstein turned our understanding of gravity on its head. Now, students in the, in the audience, please look at your teachers and be disappointed that they've been lying to you because Newton said gravity is not a force. Newton said gravity is geometry. So how do we understand that? Well, the way you've all famously seen these pictures of Einstein's idea of gravity where space-time is a grid, or you can think of it as, as the surface of a trampoline. And if you put a massive object like a bowling ball on the center of the trampoline, the trampoline curves downwards. And that's how Newton understood space-time. Space-time becomes curved when you put massive objects in there. And then if you put a little playing marble at the edge of that trampoline, it must fall in towards the bowling ball. It must follow the curvature of the trampoline, or in, in Newton's uh, uh, way of, uh, in, in Einstein's way of thinking about it, the, play, the, the playing marble must follow the curvature of space-time and fall into the, into the bowling ball. So that was Newton's, uh, sorry, Einstein's idea. Einstein also wrote a very famous equation, one that you may not have encountered yet, and that's this equation. Let me tell you, it is one of the most beautiful and one of the most horrendous equations ever written. And in, encapsulated in this equation is all of how space and time behaves around massive objects. And it's been, it's been a bear to solve. A hundred years after Einstein wrote it, we still barely have uh, exact solutions to it. So Einstein asked another question. And he asked the question, what if I take my bowling ball that's sitting on the center of the trampoline 
And instead of it just sitting there still, what if I bounce it up and down? What does space-time, or in, in the analogy with the trampoline, what does the surface of the trampoline do then? And his equations showed a marvelous and terrifying answer. It showed that just as if you would drop a, a drop of water on the surface of a pond, the surface of space-time would start to ripple, and those ripples would spread outwards. And so this phenomenon he called the gravitational wave. So it's the waving of space-time itself. When massive objects accelerate in some region of space-time, they radiate these gravitational waves, which are ripples of space-time traveling outwards everywhere. Now, it turns out that Einstein himself was very ambivalent about this idea. So again, students in the audience, you really should notice that the, one of the greatest physicists we've ever heard of had deep you know, misgivings about things that he came up with. So he formulated general relativity between 1915 and 1918, and you'll be very amused to know that the first formulation of gravitational waves in his 1916 paper was wrong. And he corrected that in 1918. In 1918, another thing happened. Uh, an, another physicist by the name of Schwarzschild looked at Einstein's ideas of gravity and said, then it must be possible to make stars that are so, so massive that even light cannot escape their gravity. Those we've today come to know as black holes, but it turned out in those days they were known as dark stars, and Einstein did not like dark stars either. He argued a great deal with Schwarzschild about why this could even be possible and whether nature would ever do this. Now, it turns out Einstein remained ambivalent about gravitational waves throughout his career. In 1936, he submitted a paper retracting their very existence. In fact, the paper was titled, Do Gravitational Waves Exist? Question mark, N-O dot. That was the title of the paper. So he submits this, this retraction with, a, with, with uh, another physicist named Rosen. Then he retracts the retraction. <laughs> and after that, he goes silent. He doesn't say anything more about gravitational waves through the rest of his life. He dies in 1955. And then another very important thing happens in 1957, where there's a meeting of some of the greatest physicists of the time who were thinking about gravity and Einstein's general relativity in 1957. And that was the first time that people started to understand that gravitational waves were real and started to ask the question of, could they be measured? Okay? Now, let me just say I'm an experimentalist. I build experiments, and so I love to remind everybody that experiment and observation always has the final say. You can have the most beautiful theory in the world, but till you prove that nature behaves this way, it is just a beautiful theory. Okay? And that came to us over a series of, of very important events in the 1960s and 70s. So, what did we see? In 1934, two physicists proposed that it should be possible to make neutron stars. Now, you've already met neutron stars. These are stars that are the mass of our sun, but only 10 kilometers in radius. Then, for, uh, in 1967, another set of physicists uh, pr uh, proposed that these neutron sh stars should be able to rotate rapidly ar around their own axes. They should be spinning. And if they do that, then because of the strong magnetic fields they have, they become lighthouses. So what does this mean? It basically means that you know, our sun irradiates in all directions. Any side of the sun you go to, you will see sunlight. Ne these neutron stars that are called pulsars, their beams are, are beamed like lighthouses. So they're spinning about their axis, and once in a while, the light beam cuts your line of sight. And so you see flashes of light, but otherwise not. So these were proposed in 1967. The first pulsar was actually observed the same here by Bell and Hewish. So astronomers started to find these objects. Then came another important chapter. A man by the name of Joe Weber uh, had been at that 1957 conference and decided it should be possible to detect gravitational waves from things like neutron stars and black holes. And he built the first instrument that could, could do so, which was a big chunk of metal. And this chunk of metal should, as a gravitational wave came by, start to ring. And just like a very high-quality wine glass, if you twang it, it should ring for a long time, and he should be able to measure that ringing. So he announces the first detection of gravitational waves in 1969, which are later proven to be wrong. This, uh, this an announcement was incorrect, so this is one of the shameful moments in science. 
The first black hole was discovered in 1971, and you'll be amazed to know that for the next 20 years, astronomers and physicists could not agree whether it really was a black hole or not. For a long time, it was like maybe it's a putative black hole, or perhaps black hole, it may be black hole. Okay, then came something very important in 1974 where a pair of, 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 of uh, physicists, Hultz and Taylor, and by the way, uh, they, uh, Russell Hultz was, I believe, the first Kasmarchik lecturer here, so you're following a long tradition of, of, of important discoveries. Um, and what they saw was something remarkable. They saw one of these li lighthouse stars, the pulsar, but this pulsar was special. It was in a binary, which means it was orbiting around a companion star that was also a neutron star. So now you have these two tiny, really gravitationally strong stars orbiting each other. And what they found was that because you can measure the light pulses from these stars, you could tell how fast they're going and what, how far apart they are from each other. And what they found was that the orbits of these two stars was shrinking, which means the two stars are getting closer to each other. Now, why are they doing that? Well, the idea was that you have two stars, they're orbiting each other, and because they're so gravitationally strong, these neutron stars, they're radiating Einstein's gravitational waves. Now, gravitational waves are just like every other wave. They carry energy. Where does that energy come from? It comes from the orbit. So what happens is these stars, as the energy is carried away, these stars have to get closer and closer to each other, and eventually they collide. And what Hulse and Taylor saw, they measured this pair of, ne of neutron stars over a long period of time, this was discovered in 74, and these measurements, these go out to 2005. People are still measuring them. And on this vertical axis is simply the size of the orbit. So how, are they getting closer? And as this number decreases, as you see from this curve, they are getting closer. And then this, so these were their data points. And then this solid line was the exact prediction of what this system should do using Einstein's equation. So this was considered to be the first indirect evidence for gravitational waves really being out there. And in fact, they got the Nobel Prize for this in 1993. So that really set the field going on, it's, these are out there and now nature makes them, should we not detect them? Now what came next was, I, I have to say, Einstein's ambivalence, however, was justified. Remember, he died in 1955 and these Oddball objects like neutron stars and black holes were not discovered until after his death. And if you think about ordinary stars like our own sun, which also occur in, in binary pairs, they just don't have enough strong gravitation to radiate sufficiently. So Einstein was right in his first paper in 1916. He said, these will have no practical purpose. And for what he knew at the time, that was right. Now, one of the most remarkable things to me about Einstein's equations and what he did with the math was that it correctly encapsulated what nature does with black holes and space time and gravity. Remember, he didn't like black holes, but his equations so far have been right. So here is a movie, and I want you to watch two things in this movie. This is a movie of two black holes colliding. And what you'll see is it's a, it's a two-dimensional slice of space-time as these two black holes go, go around each other. The colors on the surface will tell you about how much space-time is being warped. The arrows will tell you about how time is being slowed down as you go closer to the black hole. And then on the bottom here, you'll see a signal that's accumulating from the, the ripples of space-time. So these is a, a signal that literally corresponds to what we as observers far away from the system would see. So let me play the movie, and here you are. Here are the two black holes, far apart at first, and the, the two black spheres are the horizons of black holes. So these are the shrouds in which the, the black hole lives. And you can see, just as Einstein's uh, cartoon pictures have shown us, this is a real simulation using the Einstein equations. You see these dimples in space-time where the space-time curvature is made by the black holes. The black holes orbit each other, and as they, the, as gravitational wave energy is carried away, their orbits get closer and closer, and as they get closer, th that region of space feels more and more of this gravitational pull, and in fact, the space-time gets more warped. See how it's warping? And now the movie slows down, and at the moment that the black holes touch, you will see the maximum signal. This whole time, you, you, the signal has been accumulating, and right where they touch, you see a maximum signal. 
Then these two black holes collide and, and form a single black hole that wobbles a little bit, and then it kind of just sits quietly in space and the signal shuts off. So this is all encoded in Einstein's equations, and then these gravitational waves propagate out into the universe just as if you had dropped a, a, a rock in the, on the surface of a um, still pond. So that was, was this is a, a solution of Einstein's equation that comes from very recent times in the last few years. But it turns out that important things were happening in the 1960s again. So this is uh, uh, Kip Thorne. He was a professor at Caltech, who, by the way, I believe has also been a Kasmarchik lecturer. So Kip Thorne asked the question not just of, of, of uh, do gravitational waves exist? I think people were pretty secure about that. Now he, he asked, how strong are they? How do we know what the strength of this wave should be? And so here is that same picture I showed you of, of, the sig of a signal of space-time ripples that accumulate as the black holes uh, or neutron stars uh, orbit each other and eventually collide. And he, was, he put a scale on this that said, if you take a pair of neutron stars and you put them in a galaxy not too far from our own, you would get an amplitude of 10 to the minus 21. So students in the room, do you have any sense for what, what kind of number this is? It's awfully small. It's a, it's a decimal with 20 zeros after it before you have the one, right? And so that was what, uh, what Thorne um, and, 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 and colleagues at the time in the 60s started to think about. Now, how do we know what the, the, the strength of the wave is? So this is one of my few equations, and I only put it up here because I want to show you something neat about it. So this is how, how strong, this is the, how luminous the gravitational wave is, and it's scaled by a few things. Look, it, it's scaled by this size of the object. R is the size of the object, and V is the, is the velocity of, of the material in the object compared to the speed of light. So you need two things to make a good gravitational wave source. You want this number to be big, which means you want the object's radius to be small, because r is in the denominator, and you need the velocity of the object to be as close to c as possible. So you need systems, whether you make them in your lab or they're out in the universe, that are very, very small and very relativistic. So with, with their velocity is very close to the speed of light. Now it turns out, no matter how clever you are, you cannot conceive of such a source in your lab. You cannot make a so an object that is, has, is very compact, has lots of mass, and still goes at, 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 at close to the speed of light. It turns out, of course, nature does that. So the ingredients that we need is, is for the object to be compact and for it to be relativistic. And that means we need neutron stars and black holes, and we need them to be accelerating. So you need orbits or explosions, right? So some good uh, uh, sources of, of, of gravitational waves are these neutron stars or black holes that are in binaries. Now it turns out that supernovae could also be a good source. You've also been introduced to supernovae. These are exploding stars. You have a lot of mass being ejected. And so those could be a good source. Now it the other thing that is very exciting about gravitational waves is that we know that in the very early universe, there were gravitational waves, right at the very beginning of time, right after the Big Bang. So let me let, tell you a little story about gravitational waves in the early universe and, and light. So how do we know about the early universe at the moment? At the moment, what we know is measured by using light. And it turns out when the universe was very hot and dense, when it was young and it hadn't expanded enough, light was trapped along with all the particles. It did not escape. And as a result, the earliest moment in time when the light, the universe had expanded enough for the light to escape from that hot soup and stream towards us was when the universe was 400,000 years old. Now, gravitational waves, on the other hand, don't interact with all the particles and matter, so they've been streaming towards us from the very start of time. Now, a nice way to think about this is imagine you go to a party. And you go to a party with an extrovert, and you say, I'm ready to go now. And it takes a whole hour before you leave the party because they meet people, they chat with people, they, you know, and eventually you find the door and you get out. And that's light for you, very, very extroverted. Every time it meets an electron or, or, or particle, it likes to hang out and chat. 
Gravitational waves, on the other hand, are quite the opposite. That's like going to a party with an introvert and say, I'm ready to leave, and you're lucky if they'll even find the host to say thank you, and you're out the door. And that's what they've been doing. Since the beginning of time, they've been streaming towards us. So if you could detect gravitational waves from the early universe, you're looking farther back in time than light would ever allow you to do. Now, let me say one other thing. These gravitational waves from the very early universe are very faint. And so we don't have instruments at the moment that have any chance of detecting them. But certainly, the rest of my story for, for you today is about instruments that will be able to detect you know, collisions of neutron stars and black holes. But ultimately, that's what we might want to do, to look at the very earliest moments in time, in our own history. OK, so let me tell you quickly, recap gravitational waves. We know that they were predicted by Einstein's theory of general relativity. That happened in 1916. We know that they're ripples of space-time itself. So literally, they are actual space-time, uh, the space-time fabric that's rippling. We also know one other thing that I haven't introduced to you. What do they do here on the Earth? You could ask this question. And what they do is, as they move through some region of space, they actually cause that region of space to shrink and stretch. And they cause that shrinking and stretching by an amount that is proportional to the amplitude of the wave h and by the distance uh, itself. So let me show you a, a little animation that I will try to give you a sense for this. This is a grid of particles, just a nice little square grid. And if a gravitational wave goes through the plane of this, of this screen here, these particles will move farther apart from each other and closer in. And there's another thing that's important. The particles that are closest to each other will move by only a little bit. The particles that are farther apart at the two edges of the grid will move by, by more. And so let me play this for you, if I can get that to go. And you'll see that. So here it goes. So you see, the, ones that the, the particles that are closest, there's small changes in distance. If your eyes can track the ones that are farther apart, they move further apart. And this was the, an important understanding for how we might detect them. So, the other thing we know from the work of Thorne and others is that the amplitude of this wave, h, is 10 to the minus 21. And now I'm going to put a scale on this. For the first time, you're going to see really how horrid a number this is. So we will get, know that gravitational waves will change space-time distances by an amount that's proportional to the amplitude of the wave and by the size of the space-time distance. So let me use myself as the example. I'm a space-time object and I'm of order one meter. And as this gravitational wave comes through me, it will change my height by 10 to the minus 21 meters. So finally, we have a scale, and it's really, really small. I'll just put a number out there, which may or may not help you think about this. That is a million times smaller than a single proton. Okay, And that's how much my dimensions will change when this gravitational wave comes through me. And that's another reason why people for the longest time, since Einstein's early work, thought they would never be detectable. But indeed, that was not how everyone thought. So one of the things that we, we, we could ask is, how would you go about, even in principle, measuring a gravitational wave? And that's actually an, an e, a simple idea to understand. Imagine that you had a laser, and you shone that laser onto a mirror, and that light reflects from the mirror and arrives back at you. And if you had a really good clock, you would just measure the amount of time that it took for the laser light to hit the mirror and come back to you. And if a gravitational wave went by, that time would change, the light travel time. Now, it turns out that even though that's a very simple concept, we don't have clocks that are good enough to do this by factors of millions. So you have to be a little bit cleverer. And that comes from that grid of particles that I showed you where, where space-time distances were changing. So you take that same laser, and instead of shining it directly on a mirror, you actually shine it on a special mirror that splits the beam in two halves. Half the beam goes up here and reflects from this mirror. The other half of the beam comes this way and reflects from this mirror. The two mirrors reflect light, and they come back to this beam splitter. And you can measure over here, at the output here how the light changes when the two path lengths that the, the light followed in the two arms is not the same. And I'll show you a little simulation in just a moment of that. Now, why is that so much better than just using a clock? 
because in this method, you don't need a clock. One arm of the interferometer acts as the reference, and the other arm, so you're just making a comparison of did the light take longer to go down this path than this path. And if a gravitational wave comes by, those two paths will be different, and you can measure that. So you need two things to make this idea work. One is you need to make mirrors that are very, very still. Remember, the gravitational wave coming through is going to move this mirror by 10 to the minus 21 if they were a, a meter apart. And everything on the planet moves uh, mirrors and objects by factors of not millions, not billions, but trillions more than that. So you have to do a lot of work to make mirrors very still. Now imagine you did that. Imagine you've done all the engineering to make this mirror so, so still. You, that doesn't do you any good unless you have a way of measuring these tiny motions. And that's where the laser light itself comes in. We use the laser light with its very short wavelength as our, our, our ruler to make the measurement. Now this idea was put into motion by Ray Weiss. Ray Weiss was at the time in the late 60s a professor at MIT. And I'll tell you another important thing that happened in 1960. The laser was invented. And, so, and he actually worked with lasers at the time. And he came up with this idea of using such an interferometer. So this is that same L-shaped device. And now what you see in this, in this simulation is as one part gets longer and the other part gets shorter, look at the output. The light, amount of light at the output changes. And that's the measurement we make. We simply ask how much light is there at the output of the instrument. And if a gravitational wave comes by and changes the lengths of the two arms, we see a change in the amount of light. Now, Weiss did something else that was very important. He was the first person to understand that you could not use a meter-long instrument. So he proposed to make these interferometers four kilometers long. And then you see that you, you have the, you're measuring the motion of the mirrors at the level of 10 to the minus 18 meters. That's only a 1,000 times smaller than a proton. And he said, oh, yeah, we can do that. Th that's, that that's OK. And out of these ideas, Weiss and Thorne met in 1975. And together, they came up with this the idea for a very bold experiment that today we know as LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. Now, LIGO is two L-shaped instruments. One is in Louisiana in, in, this, in this bushy pine forest, and one is in the high desert east of Seattle in Washington state. Each of these is four kilometer long L's, and they have the capability of measuring motions of the mirrors in these L's that are a, a thousand times smaller than a proton. So the distances that the mirrors move by, the mirrors themselves are huge, but their motions are, are tiny. OK, so let me take you on a little tour of the observatory. So here is, uh, is the, the Louisiana Observatory. Here is the L shape. And in the center here is a laser. The laser beam goes along these two arms and recombines here, and we make the measurement. The laser beams themselves propagate in these stainless steel tubes that are quite big. They're 1.2 meters in diameter, and they have vacuum in there. And so the laser beams are propagating down there. And in the early days, there was some debate about whether to build this, this concrete cover over these, uh, these beam tubes. And we're very glad we did. <laughs> so this is um, not a Photoshop shop. This is now at our Washington Observatory. And this patrol car came over this dune and simply didn't notice that there was this four kilometer long barrier in the desert. And so uh, no, no one was hurt, neither the driver nor the instrument. Car was totaled. Now, if you go into the observatory main building, you see objects like these. These are vacuum chambers, and they're quite big. A single, uh, if I stand beside one of these right here, um, the top of my head would be below this row of viewports. And each one of these chambers holds one mirror. So you can say, why in the world do you need this enormous structure for one mirror? Because remember, we don't just use a mirror. It's a mirror that's surrounded by enormous amounts of vibration isolation. And so this is a vibration isolation system, something that's a spring mass. Many students must have studied spring mass systems. So it turns out, I'll tell you a nice, a, a nice little aside about why they're useful in other ways. They're not, they're not just there to torture us. They're actually very useful devices. Imagine you live, imagine your bedroom is on top of, of, of a garage door. And every time the garage door uh, opens in the middle of the night, the vibrations wake you up. And you have an older sibling who always comes in late and wakes you up. So what might you do? Well, there's a simple idea. You can take your bed, and you can actually hang it from bungee cords or from springs, and you tune the, the spring and the mass of the bed such 
that its natural oscillation frequency is much lower than the vibration of the garage door. And then when the garage door vibrates your room, your bed will be still. That spring mass system acts like a filter. Now, I encourage you all to try this, but I'll tell you one thing. It turns out that most people are woken up by the noise, not by the vibrations. So it will help the vibrations, but you might still wake up. But this is how you do a vibration isolation system. And the mirrors of LIGO are, are, are also hung from wires. They are hung as pendulums for the same reason, that when you have disturbances, ground disturbances on the top here, this is a chain of pendulums. And so the bottom mirror here does not move by very much, even though the top is being, is being driven by all the forces on the Earth. Now, you made this very still mirror. Then you need a very honking big laser to make the measurement. And that's what this is. So let me give you another fun fact. Does anybody know how much power I have in my laser pointer here? Milliwatts, right, exactly. So uh, if it's a legal laser pointer, it's milliwatts. There are many out there that are not. Um, but uh, this laser puts out 200 watts. So it's very, very powerful. OK, this is the control room from where this is all, all, uh, all um, observed. Now, for the next half minute or so, I'm going to interject a little bit of myself, because I've, I've, I've noticed when I talk with students that they kind of like to know a scientist's story. So here are some of my adventures at, at LIGO. So this is, this is in the early 2000s. There's me standing on the roof of the observatory watching this wildfire coming closer and closer. And, uh, and in fact, our four kilometer long concrete barrier was one of the fire breaks for stopping this wildfire from reaching the, the town on the other side. So that was pretty exciting. Uh, uh, when the Louisiana Observatory first began operations, you, this is one of the buildings where inside this building lives the, one of the mirrors. And you see this row of rods. These are a row of rods that were put in there to mark a, a row of bullet holes. And so it was hunting season in Louisiana, and so there some bullet holes arrived. And in fact, after that, there was this cartoon in the local newspaper uh, about it. So I want you to know that you know, there's, science can be a hard slog, but there's also lots of, of high-stakes adventure. Okay. <laughs> and then here is a picture of, of me in the control room right here. And then you can see this is the hard slog, where you know, I'm actually trying to do real work, not just having adventures. OK, now in the meantime, so this was in, in the early 2000s, then I, and, and through my graduate school years, which were in the, in the late 1990s. Then I w went to become a faculty member at MIT, and then I had to grow up. And so these are some of the, 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 the things I've done since then. So my work in my group has all been to build LIGO, as you saw, but it's also been to always be thinking about what's the next new technology that you need to make a better LIGO. And these curves kind of just show that. Uh, the higher the curve, the worse the instrument. So walking down these curves is, is some of the, the experiments that we do in my group, which is shown, shown here at MIT. And then one of the, the exciting things you get to do when you make a discovery is you get to do the gravitational wave dance with Neil deGrasse Tyson. Okay? <laughs> and so that's sort of been my, my story. Now, enough about me. I'm going to go back to the most exciting thing that, that, that has ever happened in my career. On September 14, 2015, the LIGO observatories were actually for the first time on the air after a five-year shutdown for, for improvements. And we registered a signal. So let me show you what happened. Here is a pair of objects. Now you're used to seeing these black holes or neutron stars. It turns out those happen to be black holes. And they did what all exactly what Einstein instructs them to do, which is they collided. And these gravitational waves propagated out into the universe for a long, long time. This collision we now know happened 1.3 billion years ago. So these gravitational waves have traveled for 1.3 billion years. And then, amazingly, they found our beautiful planet. And here they are. So the gravitational wave arrived first at our Louisiana Observatory. And then seven milliseconds later at the Washington Observatory, and no, the Earth did not shatter. This is a highly exaggerated uh, version of that. But this is what the, the uh, I'll skip this. This is what the signal looked like. 
So here are the two signals. The blue one is at Washington, which is, uh, sorry, at Louisiana, the Livingston Observatory. And then the Washington Hanford data are time shifted by seven milliseconds, so they lie on top of each other. Now there's a few things to notice about this data. The first is that the signal lasted about, about 0.2 seconds. So we only caught, so this binary system lived for billions of years, and we caught the last 200 milliseconds of its life before it, it, it collided. The other thing to notice is the vertical scale. This is the strain or the amplitude of the gravitational wave H. And indeed, at the maximum where the, the, they collided, we had a, a, a strain of 10 to the minus 21. And that corresponds to motion of the mirrors in our, of our instrument for four, four times 10 to the minus 18 meters, OK? Now, what can you learn from this set of bumps and wiggles? Actually, quite a lot. So here is a, a simplified version of what we could learn. So here is that same event, but this is now a model of it. This is at the early parts is when the, the two, two uh, uh, black holes were far apart. Then they get closer to each other. At the very maximum is when they collide. And then this is the part where they form the last black hole. So from looking at the frequency evolution, so by looking at what is the rate at which these waves are getting faster, we can tell what the masses of the, of the objects are. By looking at how the amplitude changes, so how the height of the, the, the peaks and troughs are changing, we can tell how far the, the, the black holes were. And then finally, by looking at this last part where you see this, this, the, the frequency and this decay of the signal, the signal kind of shutting off, you can tell what the mass and the spin of the final black hole were. So by doing these things, you can reconstruct the entire story of these two black holes. And in fact, it was an amazing story. So once upon a time, 1.3 billion years ago, there were two black holes. Now what they did was they, they, they did their dance around each other. And this is an incredible simulation of black holes if they were in a star field. These are the same kinds of in, uh, simulations that were used, by the way, for the movie Interstellar. And what you see is around the edge of the black hole, you see these, these rings of light, which is actually all the objects behind the black hole being lensed. And, you, the, and this is all the star field. The black holes collide, and they become one, a black hole. And this is the process that we saw unfolding in real time with those, the bumps and wiggles of our signal. Now, it turns out that we learned something else. This final black hole that was formed was actually much, uh, a little bit smaller than the two parents. So here's what we learned. We learned that the two black holes were about 30 times the mass of our sun. This is one of the beauties of scientific discovery. We don't actually quite know how nature makes black holes that are 30 times the mass of our sun. So we now have a new mystery to solve. We learned something else that was amazing. Now, this is a case where even you know, nature is more amazing than science fiction or fiction or imagination. At the moment that these two black holes collided, their velocities were half the speed of light. Imagine that, an object that's 30 times the mass of our sun, a few hundred kilometers in radius, going at almost the speed of light. This, it doesn't get more bizarre than that. So we should be very happy that we are 1.3 billion light years away from this object, this very, very violent object. We learned that they were 1.3 billion light years away. And then we learned one other thing, which is that this final black hole was not as heavy as the parents. And in fact, three times the mass of our sun, which is a huge amount of energy, was radiated away in those 200 milliseconds. So it's one of the most powerful explosions ever observed. Okay. So what we can conclude is that they did not live happily ever after. Okay. Now, I'll say one other thing, though. Even those, 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 those two black holes gave up their lives. They did give birth to the new, bigger black hole. So this is the process of regeneration in, in nature going well. So I want to close by telling you why this is so exciting. So we've seen black holes. We've seen them collide. We've seen gravitational waves. These are all very exciting things. So the first thing is, this is the first time we've directly seen ripples of space-time. Remember, for 50 years, there was a 30 years, there was a debate about whether these even existed and whether they would ever be able to measure them. So that was very nice. It's also the first time that we've seen these black holes colliding with each other and see that whole process unfolding in real time. 
the bumps and wiggles of that signal could be reconstructed into the movie I just showed you. We also, this is the first time we've actually been able to ask if Einstein's theory of relativity is correct near black holes where gravity is very strong. Now I want to tell you why that's such an important thing. This, one of the re thing, one of the earliest successes of Einstein's theory of, of general relativity of gravity was to, uh, to explain the orbit of Mercury. Now Mercury is the planet that's closest to our sun and it turns out Newton's laws didn't work there. The orbit of Mercury was not explained by Newton's uh, formula. And the reason is Mercury is the closest to our sun and it feels the strongest gravity and when gravity gets strong enough, Newton's formula doesn't work. So there was no reason for us to think Einstein's formula would work, but so far what we've seen is that it does, okay? Even around these massive black holes. Now, the last point why you know, there was so much celebration is something that's nearest and dearest to me as someone who spent 25 years of my career along with many other talented scientists building the instrument is that the machine works, okay? And so that was pretty nice too. Now, all of this is very nice, but there's something that is even more profound than that, and that is that this is in fact only the, the first things we've done. What we've really done is we've turned on a completely new way in which to study the universe. For the first time, we don't need to observe light to see what a system is doing. And in fact, we can now observe systems that may not even give off any light, as these two black holes probably would not, even if we pointed the most amazing telescopes at them. So really, that's what, what's, what's to celebrate, that we're using gravity instead of light, and this is a new tool for discoveries that I can't even begin to tell you about, because I don't have the imagination to even come up with it. And that's what's exciting about that. So let me finish then by telling you, in the meantime, LIGO made uh, 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 two other discoveries in, in, in the period uh, of that first observing run from September to Jan uh, 2016 to January 2017. And we learned a little bit about black holes that we haven't known before. And what we learned was that until the LIGO discoveries, what we knew about black holes came from those first black holes I showed you where they give off X-ray light from the gas and dust that, they're, that that's falling onto them. And this is a scale of the mass of a black hole, and the size of the circle, by the way, tells you roughly the, the, our, our, our best estimate for the radius of the black hole, the diameter of the black hole. And those black holes were all pretty low mass, you typically below 10 or 15 times the mass of our sun, and quite small. And these first LIGO discoveries are already out uh, in a different regime of bigger black holes and, and more massive. And so that's something that is uh, the you know, telling us something about the universe and nature we haven't known. And there's plenty more to come because there's no reason we, LIGO, wouldn't in time be able to discover smaller black holes as well to tell us how many are there, what are they doing, how do they grow. All right, so let me tell you the last thing, which is gravitational wave detectors are kind of like our ears and not like our eyes, for a number of, of, of reasons. And the one way to think about this is imagine that someone shown a, a, a laser pointer in the back of the room at me. My eyes could tell with very good accuracy where that little beam of light came from. Now, and if a person even you know, nearby shown a different la laser pointer at me, I would still be able to tell that it was a different person. Now, if two people in the back of the room shouted at me, I wouldn't be able to tell which one said it. My ears can't resolve the location that well. Gravitational wave detectors are the same. We can't tell exactly where in the sky the, the, the source was. And so this is how we can, the best we can tell. So that, those, that pair of black holes I showed you colliding, this is the, a, a picture of the hemisphere around the Earth. I'm sorry, the sphere around the Earth. And this is the, our best guess. It's in this huge patch of sky somewhere. And it turns out that if you had more detectors than just the two LIGO detectors, imagine you had a detector in Europe. And if that detector had been part of this detection, so you can use triangulation over long distances, then you could have told where it was a little bit better. And that's really important for us, because eventually what we'd like to do is when we see a gravitational wave, we'd also like to be able to point a telescope at it and say, is there any light coming? Can we learn anything more from this? 
And so that would motivate us to have, have many detectors all over the planet, and, uh, and that's coming. So here are the two uh, US detectors, LIGO. It turns out we do have a European partner, Virgo, which is a three kilometer long detector in, in Italy that should come on the air later this year. There's a three kilometer long detector in Japan that's under construction right now. And then there, a, a, a four kilometer long version of LIGO has just been approved to be installed in India. And in the meantime, people are already thinking about how you might do these experiments in space, and that's called LISA. And, uh, and uh, the S in LISA stands for space. And LISA is actually five million kilometers long, the separation between the, 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 the spacecraft. Because real estate and space is inexpensive. Everything else is not, but that is. So that's what's coming in the future. And so the, the thing is, let's think about Galileo. 400 years ago, Galileo, we believe, was the first person to point a telescope into the sky. And his telescope was actually a very modest instrument. It was a, a piece of glass one and a half inches this big. And what he observed is extremely modest by today's standards. He saw that the moon had craters. He saw that Venus had phases. He saw ring-like structures around Saturn. Galileo is not necessarily remembered for what he saw. He's remembered for a shift in how we do astronomy, which is we no longer looked with our naked eyes. We started to use telescopes, instruments. And in the 400 years since then, we've turned on bigger and, and better instruments. We've also added all kinds of colors, infrared, gamma ray, x-ray, radio, wavelengths of light that our eyes cannot see. And I want to leave you with the idea that that's where we are with gravitational waves today. Gravitational waves are just like light. They come in many, many colors and wavelengths. And what we've done with this first generation of ground-based telescopes is to look at the very fastest gravitational waves, these collisions of neutron stars and black holes. And there are many, many other kinds of sources, including gravitational waves from the early universe that you would see with other, in other ways. And so this is the start of a new kind of astronomy. Thank you. We'll take questions from the audience now. So, so the announcement in the room, since I have the mic, <laughs> I will take questions. And you know, no question is, is, is too, too unanswerable. So please ask. <laughs> Hi. Um, thank you. I was, I was wondering, you mentioned being able to use gravitational waves to probe the early universe uh, within 200,000 years? To, I mean, 200 million years? I forget what mm -hmm. the exact time scale was. Is it enough time for neutron stars, black holes to have formed? No. So the gravitational waves from the very early universe that we would love to get to are the ones that are emitted right after the Big Bang and before the universe cooled and after the light came out, because I think that's the place where we have the most new things to learn. So that is from a time when the universe was, so for example, if LIGO were a million times more sensitive than it is now, it would be able to see gravitational waves that were from the universe when the universe was 10 to the minus 22 seconds old, not 400,000 years old. That's the idea. Hello. Um, so you talked about um, how you spent like five years doing maintenance on LIGO and then you turned it on again. Do you just sit around and wait for the gravitational waves to be detected or do you, are you constantly doing work on the machine while you're there? That's a really great question. So it's a mixture. So the way these machines work is since there's no machine like this one ever been built before, 
we often uh, will take the instrument down for making improvements. And the, usually the, the thing that informs that is two things. The one is we want to have long chunks of data taken. So for example, after those first discoveries, just uh, uh, in December last year, we started a second observing run that will go through August. And in that time, whilst in that time, all we do is we do our best to keep the instruments running at their top performance level. And in the background, a whole team of, of people is thinking about what, what's limiting the instrument right now, how do you make it better, and we're preparing to deploy those new systems. So in August this year, for example, the instruments will be shut down, no more ob observations, and it'll go through probably a year-long period of improvements that will get us to um, improve sensitivity. And let me tell you why that's nice. So one of the things that we'd like to do, and we think we can with these instruments, is also to observe neutron stars. So far, we've been observing black holes. But to observe neutron stars, which are lighter, you actually need the instrument to perform better at lower frequencies. And so we would try to get that, that performance up in that year. And that's how we sort of arrange the program. So it's a very good question. Thank you. Um. Theoretically, if we had a wave that was strong enough to, instead of change space by 10 to the negative 21st, if it was able to change it by an entire meter, would humans be able to see that visibly, and would that be deadly to us? Yeah. So the question was that if you went, if instead of the, the amplitude of the wave being 10 to the minus 21, if it was you know, of order unity, so a meter-long object is, is distorted by a meter, you would be ripped apart completely, right? So, and, and in fact, that's part of why you don't want to be very close to the, the system that's doing this, because closer in, these, the space-time distortions are huge. OK, so, um, so far, uh, the observations have made some in ours have revealed some insights into the physics of these binary systems but do gravitational waves um, are they changed in any way by the presence of matter so that gravitational waves could be used to probe the structure of objects that exist uh, in the universe or the large-scale structures of the universe yeah so that's another great question it turns out that gravitational waves interact very very weakly with matter and as a result they're a any kind of, uh, of changes in the nature of the wave that comes from interaction with matter is, is likely to be completely undetectable for us. And that's actually one of the reasons why astronomers also love gravitational waves, because we don't have to worry very much about what's between the source and us, because they go right through all the intervening stuff. So, you know, I, I wanted to say there's a group of young women here in the front wanting to ask questions, and I really want to get the, them in. So at some point, we'll get to you. You were talking about the other uh, detectors that are going to be coming online, and I noticed that the specs were different. You were talking about three kilometer, three kilometer, four kilometers, and ours are four kilometers. Uh, why three versus four, and how are you going to calibrate the differences? Yeah, so look, I think that, that's another great question. The, the length of the detector is one of the most important knobs to turn because the signal scales with the length. The longer the detector, the bigger our signal will, will be and the, the, the easier our job becomes of detecting. So why three versus four? Four kilometers is actually a, pr a, pretty, a pretty remarkable number. It's the longest that you can make the detector uh, without tunneling because of the curvature of the Earth. So that's the longest you can make the detector where the mirrors will still kind of fit on the surface without tunneling. Now, three kilometers in Europe comes about because if you've ever been to Europe, you will notice there is very little space there. It's a very dense place, densely populated. So that's the longest that, and of course, length also costs more. So it's a matter of cost and, and space. That's right. But in principle, if you were willing to tunnel and to make longer detectors, you would always do better. Yeah. Hi. Um, I just had two questions. So um, speaking of like cost, what was the approximate overall cost of the whole experiment? And what was your personally favorite part of this whole journey? 
Okay. So two questions were asked. What was the cost? So the cost, so LIGO was, has been going since sort of the, the, the 1980s. And if you count up the cost from the time that it, the National Science Foundation, which is our US funding agency that's funded the whole effort uh, over four decades, uh, it, the cost is about $1.1 billion over 40 years. Okay. Good. And then the second question was, <laughs> the second question was, what was my personal favorite part of this? So let me uh, tell you, you know, I've had many, many wonderful adventures. <clears throat> my personal favorite part, many people think, would be September 14, 2015, when we measured the signal. And in retrospect, it is, but at the time, it was not. And the reason was that when we first, and I and many of my colleagues, when we first saw the signal, we've been in a field that starved for signal, we were completely disbelieving of it. We thought it was something self-inflicted. Oh, we, you know, the instrument's not working. Oh, we have um, calibrations going on, blind injections, which is a method by which scientists secretly inject fake signals into the data to see if we can extract our own fake signals. So we thought that was going on. So there was a period of many days over which the signal became more real for us. So it wasn't instantaneous, but now in retrospect, I would say all of it, that's what we've been waiting for. So it was the event. So thank you guys. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> uh. Um, hi. Um, so does, if another gravitational wave were to pass through, would it change the force of gravity rather than being 9.8? Would it change it to a greater force or a lesser force? Yeah. So the question is, if when a gravitational p wave passes through, does it change the, uh, the value of, of g, our local g, 9.8 uh, meters per second squared? The answer is no. It has completely negligible effects on, on any such macroscopic gravitational quantities. Like, for example, our, our uh, measurement is not at all disturbed by the fact that we have the sun's gravity and the moon's gravity to worry about. It, it, we actually just can take it out completely from the measurement. All right. Hi. Uh, I would like to know, uh, since the scale that we're working with right now in terms of the waves are sub-quantum or quantum, uh, how does quantum gravity affect your results? Yeah, so the question that was asked was, what does quantum gravity have to do with this? And <laughs> the answer is, at the moment, we don't think very much at all. So let me just tell you, quantum gravity is the phenomenon when you ask, how does gravity behave on very, very small uh, distance scales? And the truth is, we don't have very good theories for that, and these measurements don't tell us much. There's one interesting thing that we did do with these data, which is you can look at the, at the, at the waves that we measured, and you can ask yourself if they behave the way quantum gravity, a theory of quantum gravity would predict, and the particle of quantum gravity is a graviton. So you can ask, based on what we've measured, what can we say about the mass of the graviton? And we did that measurement, and we could put a limit on the mass of the graviton as being smaller than 10 to the minus 22 eV. Now, that's a meaningless number for most of you. It just says it's really, really light. Okay? But you can ask those questions, but I don't think we have much more to say about it. Thank you so much. Thank, uh, you, thank you so much, Dr. Mavavala. Thank you so much, uh, everyone who came today. Thank you.